Welcome to Grants Pass VIP. I'm Brian Pombo. What you're about to listen to is a conversation that I had with John Chambers and recorded a little bit differently. We were sitting at his dining room table and we start kind of right in the middle. (laughs) So I was asking John how he would describe what he did. And so what you're going to hear is him break that down into pieces of all the different things that he does and what those things all have in common. This is a very interesting conversation. I hope you enjoy. There is a place in Southern Oregon filled with gorgeous natural beauty, friendly yet independent people, and a mild, comfortable climate. That place is called Grants Pass. These are the stories of the people that live and work in Josephine County. These are the movers and shakers that make this place the best. This is Grants Pass VIP. All of the things that I do, they all have a theme to them. And I had not recognized it until recently. There is the nutrition aspect of it. Because if a person has proper nutrition, then they are not dependent upon the rest of, when I say the rest of the world, I mean like the medical and the government and this sort of thing to take care of them because they can take care of themselves because they have decent nutrition. They're independent of it. Also, I do drug prevention here and there, not not a whole lot, but I'm certified as that. And I keep up my certification so that I can do that. Then also, I have been teaching the Constitution. I started in 1991 a private high school that was near me. The headmaster of that private school wanted me to come and write a history text for him with no political bias because the history texts around have a lot of political bias. So I came and I was at the school and I was doing research there and talking to the parents, talking to the kids, talking to the teachers, talking to the administrators, all that, and and also studying and putting things together and so on. And after about three weeks, I went to him. His name was John also. I go, John, uh, I don't think it's possible to write a history without a political bias. Because it doesn't matter. I mean, I have my preferences, and they're going to show up just by the fact that I don't include certain things and I put emphasis on certain other things and so on. My biases are going to show up. I kind of can't help it, so it's not possible to do that. So we talked about what would be a really good thing would be perhaps a little booklet before a person starts studying history on how to pick up the bias in a history that you're reading to kind of inoculate you or to immunize you from the bias. So you can look at it, you can see what the bias is. Maybe you like the bias and you buy into it, but at least you'll see that that's what the bias is. Anyway, I wrote a little booklet called Why History? And it talks about what history is good for, what it's useful for, why you want to do it, what to look for for biases. And when I moved up here to Oregon, I turned it into a little book, which you can get it on Amazon. It's called something like uh, Learning from History, How to Make a Better Future, a little teeny booklet, and a kid can read it. And at the end of that, it doesn't matter what history book they read, because they'll be watching for what the bias is. Mm-hmm. Oh, and while I was there at the school, some of the kids came up and said, do you know anything about the Constitution? Which I did. And the reason that I did was because when I was 13, my pop sat me down. He said, you're not going to waste this summer. And he sat me down with one of those little composition books with the black and white squiggly covers, you know. And on the left-hand side of the page, I wrote out the Constitution in its original language. And then on the facing page, I would translate it into the best I could of 13-year-old modern English. So this was an assignment that your dad set you down to do? Yes. So I was to do this over over the summer. And I've told some people about that. Their kids hate them now because they're... (laughs) So I actually surprised myself. I actually stuck to it. I went through the whole thing. And there were... I I mean, I remember a few places where I was with a fountain pen, too. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And where I threw the pen, I was so frustrated. And I got splats all over, you know, ink all over. Anyway. And I've looked for that little booklet. And I... I th- it's gone. Yep. I haven't seen it for years, decades. Uh, I kind of surprised myself and surprised him that I actually finished that assignment. And at the end of the summer, he was like flabbergasted. He goes, 
what would you like as a reward for having done this thing? And he even thought of maybe I'd get a new bike or something like that, you know. I said, I want a week in the Smithsonian. And he arranged it. Wow. <laughs> I would go down, I would get dropped off at the front of the Smithsonian at like nine o'clock in the morning or whenever it was that they opened. This was many years ago when DC was not what it is now. Yeah. And I would go into the Smithsonian and I would have my little lunch with me and I would go through all the exhibits and I'd go through the different buildings and all this. And at five o'clock, I'd be out there at the curb and I'd get picked up. And get, so I did that for a week. Oh, it was just uh, great fun. But at any rate, some of the kids asked me, do you know anything about the Constitution? So I said, yeah, I, I guess I know a little. And so I figure the best way to do it is kind of the way that I did it, which was you just read through it which is basically what I had done as I read through it and translated it into English as best I understood it. The problem is that at 13 years old, I don't have enough life experience to know what these things mean. I could look at it and I go, okay, I understand what that is, but I don't know what the importance of that is. I knew that these kids were going to need a study guide. So I looked around for study guides and all the study guides, guess what? Had a bias. <laughs> and... Some of them were, you know, slanted towards religious this. Some of them were slanted towards something else. The weirdest one was interpreting the Constitution according to Freudian analysis. Oh, wow. That was really fascinating. Wow. So I read all of these things, and I'm looking at all these things, going, what could I use for these kids? So I said, I couldn't find anything. So I had to write one myself. So I would have the text. I would write some notes about it, some ways that this text had been used over the years, but I'd go and look it up and say, this is cases that came up regarding this and so on. So I had a little bit of a study guide and we went through it and I'd see the places where they were having difficulty and other places where they really got it and so on. It started becoming a regular thing. So the next batch of kids that came through would get the revised version and then the next batch would get the revised version until finally I got a version that I could set down in front of a kid Got to be, you know, a high school age kid. Of course, this was a number of years ago, and high school education is not what it used to be, I don't think. But at any rate, you could set it down in front of a kid and say, who was interested, and he could read it. And at the end of it, he would have read it through the entire Constitution, understood how it fit together and what it was about and so on, which some of the teachers and the parents thought this was really cool. And so they wanted me to teach them. So I started a little neighborhood group. And then we had a group in that school, and some of the neighborhood people found out about it. So I ran a course for the neighborhood. Since then, so sort of wherever I moved, wherever I went, I do something with the, with the Constitution. When I came to Josephine County, just so happened, I used my Constitution study guide kind of as a calling card. Well, when I first moved up here, we knew a few people. We knew some real estate people and stuff like that. And as soon as we kind of settled in, I started looking around for what's going on politically, who's doing what and stuff. And I see that Oh my God, here's this guy, this video, it was a 2010, so it was the Tea Party thing or something. And he's the chairman of the Republican Party, and he's my real estate guy. <laughs> so I go up to him and say, hey, I didn't know that you were, you know, da, da, da. this is what I do. And here's my Constitution study guy. He goes, oh, this is great. He invites me to all the get-togethers, and he takes me around by the elbow, introduces me to everybody, and says, this is the guy that wrote the book about the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> so then I started running a Constitution study group here, and he helped me set that up and so on, and I ran this Constitution study group here for a number of years. And for a time, we were at St. Anne's school. We were in a classroom in the school. We, we were in the churches. We were also at the Wild River Pub. So we've been in the taverns. We've been in the churches. Oh, Redwood Grange, I remember. We've been, yes, it, a, absolutely. That's right. And we've been in Grange and a number of different places around. And there came a point where I decided to record it. So I recorded it. It's up on YouTube, but I'm not real proud of it because as you probably have noticed, dear listener, I can stutter and hem and haw quite a bit, and that does not go over well on a video when you're trying to explain about the Constitution. And I looked at my videos, and I said, he really knows what he's talking about, but his presentation really sucks. So I joined Toastmasters. I'm now the president of our local uh, club, and I enjoy doing that, and I recommend it to anyone who wants to do something like that, and it's a great place to also to meet people and so on. And then 
I did a number of serious Constitution study group went through the Josephine County Charter with a group of people, including some of the people that were actually on the committee that originally wrote the charter and so on. Uh, we did a study group of that, and it got kind of burned out. So I stopped that. And then I wanted to kind of get back in it, but now it was COVID. So I said, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'll do it online. So I'm doing it online, and I have a small group. I have about 10 people that show up all the time. And I've got people from Pennsylvania. I've got people from Florida. I have people from California. I have people from Oregon. I have people from around the country doing this. And some of the th- my writings, because I know you're on my mailing list, so you've gotten some of my writings, some of my, some of my little daily emails that I send out and stuff. There's a pastor out in Kentucky who posts them on Facebook. Wow. And, and so I get uh, people, you know, uh, buying my books and contacting me from all over the place. I don't know where they're coming from. <laughs> you know? And it's all aimed towards independence, no longer having to be dependent. Uh, and for instance, here's an interesting little fact. There is the Revolutionary War, which started this country, right? So I said, Revolutionary War. Well, I wonder what the British call that. You know, it would be the war of those Blinken colonies, or what is it, you know? <laughs> No, to the British, it's called the Revolutionary War because it's a revolution. To us, it actually is not the Revolutionary War. It's the war for independence. That's what our war is. And yet we're calling it by the British name. We should call it by our own name. There's a number of things that have happened to the language where we no longer say what we really mean because it's a war for independence. And we actually have to continually... You and I have to battle that every day of, am I going to take this government handout? It sure is easy money. Or am I going to be independent? Because I know if I become dependent on that, I have to watch out. There's just so many things. And I'm not against using other people. Uh, I don't want to say using. I mean, uh, like, for instance, Right now, you're using me for your podcast, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I'm using you to get myself a little better known. That's right. So we're using each other. So we have a codependency here, mm-hmm. and there's nothing wrong with this codependency. The problem is when it's no longer under your control. Mm-hmm. Because right now, you or I, either of us, could stand up and say it's over and it's done. But when it comes to a point where you have to continue that dependency, then that's when you get in trouble. And that's when you get where people worry about an overbearing government, Mm -hmm. where people get hooked on drugs, where people have bad nutrition so that they end up uh, having to become dependent upon doctors and dialysis machines and things like that. So a couple of weeks ago or a month ago or so, I said, I'm a freedom fighter. That's who I am. That's what I do. And I don't have to have a musket to do it, but I am somebody that wants to make sure that you have all the independence you want in all the ways that you want. And I I know a number of ways that a person can become controlled by others, and I want to see people break free from that. Everything that you have an interest in, everything that gets your gears going, it all has to do with independence being free from mental and physical slavery, so that they all tie together with that. It does. Spiritual freedom as well. I'm always delighted when I find somebody that has a similar mindset because there are enough people around who go, oh, no, I'd rather be a slave. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. And you're welcome to it. Yeah. (laughs) But just don't take other people with you, you know? Sure. I'm real happy that, for instance, Holly Morton, who you may or may not interview at some point, who's just a dynamite lady, has decided she's she's taking the Republican Party and she's asked me to do some training for the party in the Constitution and stuff. That's here in Josephine County. She's the chairperson of the Republicans here locally. I mean, I would do it for the Democrats, too, Yeah, if they wanted. You're really nonpartisan in Absolutely. terms of, for as long as I've known you, and unlike a lot of the people I interview, we, we actually have a history and we've we've known each other for a while. 
So you've walked across the aisle. You've brought different people, very different thought into meetings together. So I I think that's really cool. And it also shows that you're not even dependent on party thought or anything of that sort. Right. And I'll give you one example of that was when I was in L.A., a lady that I ran across wanted to do in-home seminar kind of things about the Constitution and Uh so on. And she wanted to do them with me. So we did. And we did a whole series of them. And she is a member of the Democratic National Committee. So when we were talking about the Constitution, we keep each other in line, too. Because, you know, if I start saying something and she'd say, you know, you're getting political there, you're going off. And she'd do the same thing going off in the other direction. Keep an eye on each other's biases. (laughs) Exactly. Keep an eye on each other's biases. And I like to think that when I do my Constitution study group, I just do the Constitution straight or like right now in our study group that we're doing online, we're doing the Federalist Papers, and we just read what it says. And we go, oh, that makes sense. And I see why they're saying that, because that's to solve this problem and, you know, that sort of thing. And I've got some people in there that want to make sure we read anti-Federalist Papers, too. And we do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I say that when we're doing the Constitution, we're not studying politics. We're studying governance. Mm -hmm. Because governance is what unites us. Politics is what divides us. If we can deal with governance, how do we get across the river? Or just, you know, that we want to get across the river is governance. Whether we build a bridge or build rafts or go down the river to find another way, that's all politics. Mm -hmm. And we can get divided on how we're going to do that. But we have a uniting principle of getting to the other side of the river. Sure. Makes sense. Okay, let's take a break from that conversation. I wanted to bring up a question for you. During these crazy times, do you feel like your business is indestructible? Most people don't. And if not, the real question is why? And what can you do to make it as indestructible as possible? Well, that's the basis of my new book, Nine Ways to Amazon Proof Your Business. I'm going to talk about The second way, which is called being consistent, I cover this all in chapter two, and I'm not talking about being consistent in a very generic way. I'm talking about specifically being consistent in your communications with your customers, not just customers you're looking to have, but customers you've already had and getting them to know, like, and trust you. Now you could be doing this through paid advertising, but you could also be doing it organically through social media, via videos, via blog posts, via podcasts like this, getting out there so that people can get to know, like, and trust you so that when they do become customers, they don't just become customers that enjoy and love your products or services. They know, like, and trust you as a person. That's a value they can't get from big companies. I also have eight other ways to Amazon proof your business. Basically the idea of making it competition proof to even someone as big as amazon.com. So if you'd like to get your hands on a free copy of my book, go to amazonproofbook.com. Sign up and you will get a free copy and get the chance to purchase a physical copy of it for a special price. In addition to that, if you happen to be in the Josephine County area or nearby and you're looking to have a speaker come and discuss these type of issues with your organization, club, or group of friends, then I have a limited calendar that I may be able to fit you into. Go check out brianjpombo.com slash speaking and fill out the application. We'll be sure and get back to you on that. And now let's get back to our show. So I've heard some of your story before, but what brought you originally to Josephine County? My wife was in Josephine County. She was in Grants Pass when my first wife passed away in the 1990s. Now, I have known Debbie through church connections because we're kind of in the same circles and stuff. I'm just sort of in passing kind of uh, for decades. And when my wife passed away and I was, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places, you know. (laughs) And one of the ladies that worked at the school that I was doing the Constitution at and so on, she related to Debbie. Somehow they had letters back and forth, and Carlin, that's her name, showed me a letter from Debbie. And the letter from Debbie said, it's too bad he has a girlfriend because her husband had just left her. 
<laughs> so I go, oh yeah, I know Debbie. I've actually secretly admired her for decades. I mean, I was married, she was married. I wasn't going to do anything, you know. It's just like, but after my wife died, I would ask, and if I happened to see her either in L.A. or someplace, you know, and I would say, and how's Bob? Bob being her former husband. And she'd say, oh, Bob's fine. And I'd say, okay, thank you very much. And I'd walk away because, and she thought I didn't like her. <laughs> so anyway, turns out Bob left her. She wrote to Carla. I said, this is right for me. I called my girlfriend. I said, it's over. Over the phone. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I wrote Debbie a letter. We just started a conversation. And we just, yeah, the conversation went exactly the way it's supposed to go. And three months later or so, we were married. She was in Grants Pass. And the reason she was in Grants Pass is because her mom had been early on an alcoholic and really quite uh, in bad shape. And she found Roy Masters, and Roy Masters picked her up. I have my own opinion, but we're not going to do that. I mean, it picked her up, and it was good for her, so that's fine. So she moved to Grants Pass back in the 80s, and Debbie, you know, kind of was with her. There was some back and forth all the time, so she was up here. And while she was up here, she has two sons who were coming to the marrying age, and they were down in Williams. And one of them caught the eye of one of the Lathrop twins, which if you're in Williams, you know who the Lathrop twins are. <laughs> and I was in L.A., and Debbie was up here in Grants Pass, and I said, I can't really move up there because I work down here and stuff. I like see it's have to move down here. So she said, okay, I'm going to move there. And the Lathrop twin said, the big city? Get me out of Williams. So the son, grandchildren, everybody picked up. They came down to L.A., including also mom, who was getting a bit older. So she lived with us and with the family nearby. So we had four generations of us all nearby in L.A. And then uh, Debbie's mom died. She had a plot up here. So we uh, got her body up here. I came up here and we looked at the town. And Debbie and I, we just looked at it and we said, this feels like home. And so I called work in L.A. I had a couple of clients. I said, I'm going to go to Oregon thinking I would really like to be able to work remote, you know. <laughs> and they said, you're going to Oregon. Uh, can you work remote? <laughs> By this time also, we'd been down in, in L.A. for 10 years. And the, the Lathrop twin said, I've had enough of the big city. Get me back to Williams. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody moved back. So now we're in Josephine County. Fabulous. But I never heard the full story like that. That's pretty cool. So what do you think it is about this area that made it feel like home? Well, more than anything else, it has to be the people because that's what makes the difference anywhere. Because of our nutrition business, we're in the Chamber of Commerce. So we know a number of the business people here and we just see that there's a lot of I don't want to overuse the word caring because it's kind of, <laughs> it can become too maudlin. But we have a community here. That's the deal, is we have a community. And even though sometimes I feel like I'm kind of not really being much of a member of the community, I know that when I get out there, then I know you. And, you know, it's like, and we do things together and we have things. And there's just like that uh, all around in this community. So we have a community of interest that we will help each other out and stuff like that. I mean, that's what it is, I guess. I mean, because when I was standing there on the hill at the cemetery, just sort of looking out across the town, and I said, this feels like home. I didn't know because I didn't know the community then, yeah. but I just, I, you can sort of feel it as kind of in the air that mm -hmm. there is a sense of community. We're not all each in our own little silo. Yeah. But we're also not insulated and saying, well, this is our community and no, you're not welcome. Yeah. It's like you trust people until they prove themselves to be untrustworthy. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know? right. Yeah. Because there are some places the attitude is you don't trust anybody until they prove themselves to be trustworthy. That's now, right. The other way around here yeah. is you trust somebody until they prove themselves to be untrustworthy. That's much more American. I mean, it's like innocent until proven guilty. It's, mm -hmm. My goodness, it's all fitting together. <laughs> Very cool. That's perfect. So 
One of the reasons why I started having this podcast for perfectly selfish reason was to be able to meet more people sure. in the community and be able to get out there and kind of be a source of networking. So I, one of the things I try to do with the guests that I have on is ask, who are the type of people that you're looking to meet? Because you've got a lot of different interests. They all tie together within this independence mm. concept. But who are the type of people that you think would be great meeting and you wouldn't mind them reaching out to you? Well, I'll tell you an example of somebody that we just had today. Debbie and I went and did the home show in the fairgrounds. Then we went around and visited all the booths and stuff. I talked to a fellow who happens to be a vacuum cleaner salesman. And uh, it just so happens we have to be in the market for a vacuum Actually, it's an air filter, air cleaner as well as mm -hmm. that. I mean, it's kind of in the market for that. And so he wanted to come over here and do a demonstration. And I, I used to sell Kirby vacuum cleaners. I only sold them for a month or two over a summer. But, you know, you go into the person's house and you demonstrate what you got, and you, mm -hmm. you know, and so on, and they buy it or not. And so he came over and we were talking. Well, we matched. There's so much that we match about and interest in health nutrition, interested in community, and in, in his product, and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and he's just a great guy. So we're going to maintain communication. Now, usually you sell a vacuum cleaner and you're out the door, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, well, now, this fellow, we're going to maintain communication with him, and in fact, he's up in Salem, but he likes doing what they call urban farming, Mm -hmm. where he, mm -hmm. he has his own little plot, you know, in whatever size of place he has in Salem. But I happen to have a buddy who was on my, he was on my mailing list, and I knew him decades ago in San Francisco, back when we were all hippies. Okay, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, uh, and he has a website devoted to urban farming. And so I'm going to, you know, give him that website and stuff. It's just like we all can kind of connect with each other. And now that COVID has forced us to get out into the Internet, we can connect more broadly, which is like what happened with my study group. Instead of just being a Josephine County study group, I've got people in Pennsylvania and Florida mm -hmm. and all that. So the type of people that we're looking for is people who are open, people who like looking at the world, people who like to be independent, but also recognize that they have a responsibility to others and a kind of a co-responsibility to, I don't want to say look out for each other, because that's not really quite it. It's be mindful of the other person. That's really not quite it either. It's like you and I, we can not see each other for weeks at a time. And yet when we get together, it's like we've never been apart. Mm-hmm. And I care about what happens with you and your kids and your wife. And, you know, and if you had some kind of situation, you could always call me, you mm -hmm. know, you mm -hmm. know, this kind of thing. Sure. I may or may not be able to do anything for you, but yeah, <laughs> you, you can call and yeah. I'll say, oh, Brian, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if yeah. I could do something, I, I that's right. or I might know a guy because I'm a guy that knows guys. Yeah, that's right. You are. <laughs> So I'm looking for people who are eyes wide open yeah. and are willing to look at things because, I mean, we did mention that there are some people that would prefer to be dependent, would prefer yeah. to. I don't need them. Yeah, I understand. I'm not going to kick them either Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because they're people, but you're not going to be my buddies. Yeah. But you're my buddy, which, by the way, actually what I wanted to do, and I want to tell everybody here that... Brian Pombo is probably the best political analyst I have ever spoken to in my life about what is going on. You can listen to CNN or you can listen to Fox News and you can have all of those analysts and they can tell you what's going to go on and stuff. And Brian just cuts through the whole thing and he says, well, this is where it's going to happen. And six months down the road, that's what happened. <laughs> Brian is very, very aware of all that. Anyway. <laughs> Is my check in the mail now? <laughs> That's right. You, you will get that later. <laughs> I'm sorry. I admire your acuity in that area just Thank you. so much. And there's a whole bunch of things that we could cover. COVID-19, we're recording this in late April of 2021. We've gone through a, this huge portion of COVID-19 craziness. Has it changed your lifestyle much at all? And if so, how? No. 
Actually, I'll tell you the real reason it hasn't is because in January of 2020, before we even knew there was a COVID-19, it was not, nobody was talking about it. Nobody, I got so deathly, horribly sick. I was just like, and I don't get sick. And I had this horrible, you know, the head horrible. Oh, it was just awful. And then it went away and then it came back and it was in my chest and it was, just, I thought I would never get rid of it. I thought I was going to die. But it didn't slow me down. I mean, I was able to go and do things and stuff like that. And I just knew that I had this this thing, whatever it was. Anyway, my body finally managed to take care of it and so on. And it was some months later, I was talking to a lady who was going to start using some of our nutrition products and so on. And she's down in Bakersfield. We just started talking about a little bit about COVID. And she said, oh, yeah, uh, down here in Bakersfield, everybody in my family got COVID back in December, January, and so on. And we know it was because it has all the symptoms and all that kind of stuff, which made me look back to my experience in January, and I said, I had all the symptoms. Mm -hmm. So even though, you know, I didn't get a test and somebody said, oh, yeah, you got, got it or whatever, well, at that time, there were no tests. And if you had the symptoms, they said, you got COVID. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you, I had COVID, yeah. and I don't care. No, you can tell me that I didn't because I didn't have a test. I don't care. I had COVID, I and it's not something I would wish on anybody, but I also know that it's not only survivable, it is something that nutrition can help because it builds your body back, and happily, they've found that zinc and vitamin D and vitamin C and so on, there's a number of things that you can do which actually reduce the symptoms and so on. And, of course, because of COVID and the attention that is put on health, I turn that into attention that's put on immunity. You need to build your immunity. And we just started doing Zoom calls. And so we used to do meetings in home here, and we had you know, seven or ten people come over, and you know they'd get excited about the products and so on. We couldn't do that anymore, so we do it on Zoom. And it's just like everybody wants better immunity. Our business boomed. Mm -hmm. I know that there's businesses that did not. There were businesses that were shut down. But our business boomed because people wanted this and because our company is known by the CDC and the USDA and government agencies that deal with nutrition and deal with immunity and deal with it, known as being scientifically, I don't, I don't want to say superior, but it is, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let's just say well-respected yeah. and so on. So we were named as an essential business. The only effect it's had on me is wanting to reach out to more people and say, you don't have to be dependent and cowed just because they say that there's this that's going on. You are your own person. Keep your eyes open. And it's not we'll get through with it. It's we don't even have to bother with it. Mm. It's the kind of thing that you, I want to just tell people, snap out of it. <laughs> you know, just look around mm -hmm. uh, and see that it's not that bad. And there's a number of people here. We, we were talking with one uh, lady that's in the Chamber of Commerce, and she has relatives back in Michigan. And she goes to the relatives back in Michigan. They're all afraid. To, ooh, 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 they're afraid, you know, and so on. And she here is, yeah. It's more of an attitude as to whether or not you're going to be scared of it and stuff. Kudos to you for making lemons out of lemonade, shall we say. Taking a situation that can very easily stop things in their tracks, but actually using it as a way to be able to help more well, people and reach more people in a way. For example, I've got my original podcast was called Off the Grid Biz Podcast, and it's all about self-reliance based businesses and interviews I've done with them. They've... During this period of time, most of them have seen extreme growth right. because of this newfound desire and being more independent and, you know, getting people's nutrition right and everything else. So it's great that you've been able to be able to prosper Kept while, while, helping, yeah, while yeah. helping other people. Yeah. This is my last main question, which is if we were to get together 12 months from now, let's say we had another podcast or what have you, and we look back over the year. What would have had to have happened between now and then for you to feel happy with your progress, both professionally and personally? I think I'm probably going to be happy no matter what it is. 
uh, there are some things I can think of that I would make me unhappy <laughs> because we have some forces in the world which are attempting to suppress people. But I think that if uh, we just kind of keep doing what we're doing and growing in the nutrition business and also the interest that people are having in, in good government, and there's a lot of good things that are happening also in terms of uh, drug prevention and stuff too, that if it just continues kind of along the way it is, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be going to be happy the way it is because it's going slightly increase, slightly increase, slightly increase. Something's going to come along that's going to bounce it up or something's going to come along that's going to bounce it down and you got to fix it so the down part or see what made the up part happen and see what you can do to strengthen it and stuff. It's just sort of steady as we go. And I realize things are falling apart in general, but if the people around me, if I can influence them to be more independent or to continue to be independent and can reach out a little more, just a little more, we'll see what happens and what comes next. What would make me happy a year from now? To see the sun still rise in the east and set in the west. That's what's going to make me happy a year from now. <laughs> Fabulous. No, that's great. Are there any questions I did not ask that you'd like to answer? Right now, there's a whole problem that's going on with race in this country. And I've studied this and I understand critical race theory and I understand what they think and where it comes from and what it's about. And I understand, for instance, mathematics is racist. Why would mathematics be racist? Well, I know why they want to consider mathematics racist. And I want I want people to understand that because otherwise we look at this and I know, and I mean, there's a number of people that I know that are like, their head kind of explodes when somebody talks about race because it's all a big mishmash. But I've studied enough of what's going on with it that I can explain why mathematics is racist. And as soon as you see that, you go, oh, and it's like the whole thing falls apart. It's like a big Chinese puzzle that just like falls apart as soon as you get the key pieces out of it and stuff. I would love to talk about that sometime. <laughs> okay. No, that's great. We'll have to dig in deeper, if not here, somewhere else and go into that. Okay. What could people do that would like to find out more about what it is you do, either in terms of your views on the Constitution or the things that you do locally or your nutrition business? What's the best way for people to reach out to you? We're in the Chamber of Commerce. Just go look for Neolife Nutrition in the Chamber of Commerce, and that's us. I will give you one little website, which is a video, not even done by Neolife Company, that deals with, if a person wants to know more about nutrition, this is an excellent kind of beginning video. When I do my online presentations, I use this. The point of it is that food is supposed to give us all the nutrition we need. However, we know that it doesn't. And the reason that we know that it doesn't is because 75% of us take supplements. So we know that it doesn't. Well, how do you choose which supplements? How do you know what's a good one? How do you know? So there are criteria for determining what's a good supplement. And this website is five, the numeral five, key, K-E-Y, criteria, C-R-I-T, whatever that is, criteria, mm -hmm. <laughs> five, key, criteria, dot com. It's a 10-minute video. It just goes what the criteria are. And then if you like that, you can contact us uh, through the Chamber of Commerce, Neolife. Fabulous. Great. We'll have both those links available in the description. Uh, oh. So if you check that out over at Grants Pass VIP, regardless of where you're hearing this, you'll be able to go directly to those places that John recommended. Great. Thank you. Well, John, this has been a lot of fun, <laughs> as <laughs> always, with you. And but look forward to talking with you in the future. Thanks for being on Grants Pass VIP. It has been my pleasure. I love doing this. Thank you very much, man. Unlike many of the conversations that we have here at Grants Pass VIP, the conversation with John was from the perspective of knowing him for quite a while. John is the type of person that isn't only doing one thing, if you haven't noticed. He, he has many areas of interest and many activities that he goes through on a daily and weekly basis. So it was fun sitting down and kind of dissecting that process with him. 
I hope you've gotten a lot out of it too, because I know I have. Even in looking at my own life and all the little things that I have my hands in, what are the common threads? It's a very interesting question, and I love the way that John breaks it down. Whether you agree with him or disagree with him philosophically, you have to admit he's an interesting person, and he's the perfect type of person that I love to have on Grants Pass VIP. Join us again on the next Grants Pass VIP, brought to you by the team at brianjpombo.com. Helping movers and shakers in Southern Oregon and beyond stand out. That's B-R-I-A-N-J-P-O-M-B-O dot com. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest or a sponsor on Grants Pass VIP, go to grantspassvip.com forward slash contact. Guests who appear on the show do not necessarily endorse the opinions of the host or sponsors. The theme music is Fun Shot by Kevin McLeod. Our host is a Grants Pass resident and business strategist, Brian Pombo. I'm executive producer, Shawnee Douglas. Until next time, live rogue and have fun.